<clears throat> but yeah, so so the next uh, hour is is going to be totally dedicated to uh, Shattered Crown. All right. And it is Crown, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm yep. making sure there was no S after it. Nope. I, I have this tendency to start flubbing those things if I uh, don't double check them. I mean, a lot of people have used Shattered Crowns, but I don't. But ours is just Shattered Crown. Awesome. It, yeah. All right. So, with all that said. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tim will not, unfortunately, be joining us, or fortunately, however you decide to look at it, be able to join us tonight. He uh, he has a work dinner that he's engaged in, and as such, he has left the show in my capable hands. Dun, dun, dun. Some, some, some ominous stuff going on. But... To save you all from having to listen to me Babylon about something for an hour, I have gone and found some people, or actually they found us, or something like that, who uh, who decided they want to come on and talk about their project, their game, Shattered Crown. And we have Lee Gaddies and Susan Howell, Howes. See? Told you I was going to start screwing the name up. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> from Gaddis Gaming... <laughs> Um, to talk about their game, like I said a minute ago, Shattered Crown, that is on Kickstarter. Yes, yeah, it's so funny you you predicted it. You said it right from the beginning. So I would start messing up names and boom, that's uh, so funny. I do. If I don't, if I don't practice them, if I don't say them like ten times in my head before I go, yeah. you know, it, I do. I just, you know, I'm one of those people. I hear a name and I hear it, but it goes right out the other ear. So. You know, I uh, totally agree to you that. Yeah, no, there's there's many of us like that. Yeah. So, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, we're we're really grateful for you taking the time out of your your schedule uh, to highlight uh, this project that we're working on, um, Shattered Crown, and the whole General Assembly Universal Rules Data System has been a a passion project for us um, as gamers. We uh, we wanted to create something uh, for the gaming community that highlighted the aspects of skirmish gaming and war gaming uh, that we like here at um, at, at Gaddis Gaming. Uh, to give you a little bit of backstory on it, we were um, we were uh, doing a uh, a version of the game. Uh, for the last three or four years, um, it was called Bolt Action Wolfenstein, where we took uh, our Bolt Action miniatures and mixed it in with the the theme from uh, Castle Wolfenstein. I don't know if you're familiar with that video game. Yes. Yeah, and uh, and so we would play that every Halloween, and it got uh, so popular that people started wanting us to play it at local conventions. So we did a Star Wars version of it and played it at local conventions. And then, um, and then again, uh, we would get uh, a lot of input about it. So we said, well, look, why don't we just go ahead and codify the rules, you know, the way we like to play. Because we end up just buying all the miniatures that we like and we end up playing, you know, this rule system that we're using to uh, to play those those games using those miniatures, be it historical or uh, sci-fi or even fantasy. So uh, we spent about a year uh, working on the rules, refining them, uh, you know, trying not to make them too complicated and uh, taking them out to the conventions and, and public. And then we decided that, Hey, you know, let's go ahead and start um, since this is the hundredth anniversary of world war one, uh, we'll go ahead and start with a World War One version uh, because we felt that the 
the World War II market was really crowded with um, with Clockwork Goblin and Bold Action partnering to come out with Conflict 47, uh, Dust relaunching with Dust 47, and then uh, all the other people who had done stuff earlier in the decade and fell off had started to get on them that resurgence of the weird war uh, aspect. Uh, and so we said, well, why don't we do something a little different? So we'll go to World War I, um, and we'll use this opportunity to highlight uh, some of the greatest soldiers that, uh, that the American military has had, and that was the Harlem Hope Fighters from World War I, who'd never been celebrated in the 100 years of gaming in a game. So that's how Shattered Crown came about uh, as, a, uh, as, as a property and as a miniatures game. Uh, as a company, we already uh, manufacture and sell World War II miniatures and vehicles. Uh, so, you know, parlaying that into World War I and then slowly graduating as our fan base uh, grows for people who, who like our rule system. And then we'll put out a supplement for World War II and then so on and so on and so forth. You know, after that, you know, depends on where the, where the fandom uh, carries us. So. All right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so so that's so that's the backstory, you know, for Shattered Crown. Um, and but as a company, before that, we got started as a company because uh, we make an item uh, that we had patented that Susan uh, had came up with called the uh, the table topper, and it converts any uh, surface into a four by four if you're playing X Wing or you know, a game like that or four by six playing surface. It's a modular portable playing surface. And that was our first product. And then our, uh, and that's what we originally kickstarted, um, back in 2014. And then in, uh, and then we came up with some supplemental prod, uh, products for carrying your miniatures. Let's say you're at a tournament or you're at a store and they're called auto play zones. And we designed these for, uh, some people at our local store that were playing 40k and another game called uh, uh, what is it that TV it was Triumph and what was the other one I can't remember yeah um, for a, a historical skirmish game and so the little um, we had a place for your drink and your dice and your miniatures could all sit in this little zone off the table so you wouldn't be rolling dice on your miniatures or into your terrain. And um, and then uh, then we uh, started manufacturing, uh, casting uh, World War II uh, figures, and that was our second Kickstarter. Uh, okay. And that was successful. So uh, we had a full line. Uh, I think we're up to about 680 different uh, World War II miniatures across all six of the major nations. Oh, wow. That's... Yeah. Uh... That's definitely the collection right there. Yeah, that, it's, it's a pretty extensive line. Uh, and and now we just got into vehicles this year um, uh, to go with them, you know, 156 scale uh, vehicles. So all of our all of our miniatures are 28 millimeter, uh, true 28, not the GW heroic scale. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> otherwise, our vehicles would be 148 scale. Okay. And, uh, and so, uh, so we had we had the table, we had the miniatures, and now through evolutionary process, we have the uh, rule system. And the, you know, because we figured that if when we launched, we wanted to have the complete rules, miniatures, vehicles, everything, everything you would need would be in the box, right? Your tape measure, your rules, your you know, your tokens, your counters, everything would be right there, you know, to play with. So when you open up the box. You know, you and a battle buddy, you and a friend could get together, you know, go in on a, on, a, on an army and, and play it right out of the box. Yeah, with the minimal amount of uh, a preparation. And then if you wanted to paint them and all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, as part of the hobby, because we enjoy the hobby aspect of it also. So, you know, prime them, paint them, and, and off you go. Awesome. All right, so... Um, Shattered Crown, as I was looking at the uh, Kickstarter a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. there is there's a battle suit concept up there, so it's mm -hmm. not strictly pure um, 
World War One. It's a little bit more weird. Yeah, yeah. So here, here's the beauty of the game system is that you can play it historically or ahistorically, right? So if you want to, so um, you know, the game system had already been created before we decided to do World War One. Right. We just adapted it. We showed the adaptability of the game system by gearing it towards World War One. But we we like to play our games a little weird, i.e. bolt action Wolfenstein. Right. So. Right. So that's that's how we like to play. You know, we like the Tesla cannons and the zombies and the werewolf, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, laser beams. You know, we're all we're, we're all in on that, you know, because it adds variety and it spices up the game. Um you know, but we also enjoy a straight historical game too. You know, we we can play, you know, something, you know, the Battle of Samon or or however you want to, you know, whatever battle you want to play. You put it on the table, we'll play it. You know, that's the kind of gamers we are. So for us, um, making the game more inclusive and having our own story that way than making it just a dry, you know, history read. You know, because <laughs> how many times can you play guys sitting in trenches shooting at each other? <laughs> across the line, right. You know, so we wanted to spice it up. So we threw that in there. Um, and so therefore we can create an ecosystem and a universe where all these things kind of make sense. It makes sense to have these things. Now, if you want to play the game, you know, let's say we go to a historicals only convention and you can only play historicals. Well, the rule system lends itself that you could play the game straight historical. You know, you can okay. you know, carve out the weird aspect and play it, you know, mud and blood, as it were, and guys in trenches shooting at each other with machine guns. You know, you can play it that way. But the way we like to spice it up and the natural evolution of the game, like most games go, you know, as you you know seen with Bolt Action, evolved with Conflict 47, because once you buy your armies and you played, you know, all of 1939 to 1945, then where do you go from there? You know, you have to you have to take that next step. So that next step is built into the game. So you can get many, many hours of replay uh, out of our out of the General Assembly uh, universal data rule system, which is guards for short out of our guards rule system. Um, and that and if you learn that system, you can play the World War Two game. You can play, you know, modern combat. You can play near future post apocalyptic or straight into sci fi, you know, 40K type games if you want. All right. So tell me about the guards system. Okay. The guard system is it's a D10 system, you know, because we want it. We, we, we chose D10 over D6 because we wanted more granularity uh, in, in how we play. We wanted to be able to fine tune weapons and skills. And uh, so the guard system allows you to be able to. Um, make rolls using one dice that have a, a much a much greater variation in outcome than the 33% change you get on a six-sided dice with each roll. So and I know it's probably boring a lot of people because it deals with a lot of math, but <laughs> and prob- <laughs> math and probability. But just to make it say we wanted to make it more likely for more different things to happen in the game. Right. So the D10 allowed us uh, that flexibility and also gave us a common uh, dice that that most people probably have in their collections, you know, or die. I'm sorry. I've been correct on that many times. Uh, uh, So uh, with with the guards rule system, um, it's we wanted to create a universal playing system. So um, like in, in RPGs, like GURPS, right? There is a universal aspect to it. You could take the the GURPS system and use it in any uh, setting um, that's appropriate. Well, for wargaming, the guard system does that exact same thing. You know, okay. you, you want to play knights in armor here. This is how you play knights in armor using the guard system. You want to play, you know, uh, musket and shot. This is how, you know, Napoleonics. This is how you do it. You want to play World War One. You know, which is to me the funnest because that's when all the first the toys first got invented, right? The first use of an airplane uh, in combat, the first use of a tank, the first use of uh, a machine gun on a mass scale, you know, that kind of stuff. So what we know as modern weapons today had their founding uh, in World War One, 
And uh, so for us, it was the natural jumping off point to do all the other things that we wanted to do with the system. And then, like I said, it scales all the way up, you know, uh, to to doing straight up, you know, uh, sci-fi. So for us, um, we didn't like, okay, if we want to play this game, we got to learn this system. If we want to play that game, then we have to learn this other system. And then to play this other game, we have to learn this totally other system, right? But um, the idea came to me when I was playing Wings of, of Glory. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Yeah. So Wings of Glory, it's, um, you know, with the, with the miniatures that they have, and they use a card system, right? So you slide your miniatures along the track on the, on the playing card, right? And then, I, then we learned how to play X-Wing. And then I realized, wait a minute, X-Wing, Wings of Glory, Star Trek Attack Wing, um, D&D Attack Wing, and Tanks all use the same system. You know, if I learn how to huh. use this one system, I can play them across all these different games. Fantasy, historical, two sci-fi games. And or in tanks is a historical game more or less, you know. But they use that same type of system, right? So okay. So there's so there's five games with variations on the same system. But if you know the base system, you know you you can easily adapt into either, any of these games. You know, with just learning little tweaks based on shields uh, depletion and star and Star Trek. Um, you know, the upgrade cards are the same for Star Trek or Star Wars and tanks. You know, there's not any really up- upgrade cards in Wings of Glory. You just have your pilot card. Um, and then D&D Attack Wing, you know, it's the same thing for each, for the creatures. You know, there's no real upgrade cards, just different weapon type for different creatures. So so I was like, well, why can't we create one for wargaming, for the types of games that we like to play? So, like I said, we sat down and we went through, you know, how we played, what we liked, you know, incorporated in, play tested it over and over again. You know, this is our second year. We started in 2016. So 2017 of going to all the different conventions and play testing it. And what really surprised me about the guard system is how much fun people were having, how much laughing and, and joking was going on. And I think that was the key to it, it being a hit. Bless you. Thank you. It's how, it's how much joking, you know, it wasn't people arguing about the rules or what need to be changed or what need to be upgraded. It was, you know, they were rolling dice and they were telling a story and they were having a good time. That's, you know, that's always a good thing, especially with uh, historicals. Yeah, and we hardly ever see anybody laughing at a historical game <laughs> at a convention. But these guys, you know, they were laughing and having a good time, especially World War One, when it's so, like, just dry. You know, it's a very dry uh, period in which to uh, to play, you know, uh, as far as, you know, things going on. Uh, but, you know, some people are into that and, and more power to them. You know, we're not telling people how to enjoy their hobby. And we're not telling people how to enjoy the hobby with this either. We're giving you options. Yeah, you know, exactly. You know, we're saying this is how we like to play. And here's an option if you want to play it straight historical. Here's your tanks. Here's your weapons. Here's your infantry. You know, have fun. You know, and if you want to play like we like to play here's the other option here's some different weapons infantry you know and 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 a story to go with it and that's and that was the main thing uh we use the um uh the martian invasion uh of hg wells as the jumping off point uh for that so in 1890 in the shattered crown universe uh the martian walkers came in they landed the bacteria wiped them out but what was left all right. What was left behind was all of the Martian walkers. So the nations of the world were gathering those walkers. And for the last 20 years, they've been trying to to, to um, retro engineer uh, the technology. Right. Mm-hmm. They've been reverse engineering it, you know. Uh, so now, you know, political tensions have risen and war breaks out the same way it did in uh, in, in in our world, World War One. And uh, and so the nations go to war, only this time they have uh, Tesla cannons uh, in their tanks, and they have, you know, Tesla bombs, and they have laser be- or death rays, as they call them, uh, the colloquial terms for the time, 
you know, and now they've been experimenting with some mutagenic chemicals that they've uh, siphoned from the Martian walkers, and then shenanigans commence from there. <laughs> shenanigans. Shenanigans yeah. are always a good thing. Yeah. So, you know, so this is a um, a 28 millimeter uh, scale game. Um, uh, we have a point system. If you want to build your own army, is built into the guard system, so you can. It's customizable. So uh, the faction breakdowns are usually uh, you have a hero unit that represents your nation, uh, and then you would have uh, a command team with some special abilities. A hero unit with its own unique special abilities. A command team which you can uh, customize with special abilities. Uh, you would have two platoons of infantry, uh, a support uh, unit, you know, it'd be an artillery or a mortar or machine gun, and then you would have a vehicle, and that could be a tank, an armored car, you know, depending on the point system. Yeah. Right. So, so far, uh, for that configuration, we're topping at uh, the average game is about 700 points, and it takes about an hour to play. Hmm. An hour. That's actually pretty quick. Yeah, it's a, it's a beer and pretzels game, you know. Uh, the the core rule set themselves, I think, are only eighteen to twenty two pages. The rest of it is fluff and 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 add on, uh, you know, very you know variables for the game. You know, so there's a scenario generator. You know, so you can generate a scenario right out of the book. Um, you know, if you don't have one, you know, that you already, if, that your imagination comes up with, you know, we can, we can prod you along a little bit uh, with that in the book to give people an opportunity to say you meet up with a friend and you don't know what you want to play. You just, ro- you can roll for it. Right. Okay. You know, you can roll for your scenario. Um, and then all the details are there. Um, you know, it's a low model count. You know, you don't need, you know, 60 or 70 models to play unless you know, you want to do an apocalypse game or something like that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, you know, it's made, you know, it's made to be played in an hour, you know, so that way you can get a, you know, you can play a campaign because there's a campaign system in the game also. So that if you and a friend, you know, want to build up your forces, you start with, you know, you know, green troops, you know, and then you build up to you can buy a hero. And with the point system, you in the next game you play, you can bring in new, more powerful unit. In the game after that, more newer and powerful units, you know. So the game is structured, um, the tutorial is structured that way so that you start off with just basic infantry, learning how to move and shoot and use terrain and, and, and cover, you know, because line of sight and cover are two important parts. Um, for you as an attacking player, uh, you get uh, bonuses for having clear line of sight, and you get deductions if your line of sight is blocked by terrain, right? Um, so when you roll to hit, it makes it harder to hit if you have to shoot through other obstacles, right? And if you're a defending player, uh, it adds uh, bonuses to your defense dice when you roll them, and these are all 10 uh, D10 uh, dice uh, if you are in cover, if you're taking cover, and what type of cover you're in. So okay. uh, so there's two roles. You know, it's an opposing role system. There's a role to hit, and let's say a, a veteran player needs a, a five or better to hit. Well, if I'm shooting through two pieces ter- of terrain, now I need a seven or better to hit. So it just makes it harder for me to hit you, Right. Then there's a saving throw that the defender gets, the guy that you're shooting at. So if I'm behind a wall, you know, let's say my armor class is nine, uh, I want my armor class to be low, right? Uh, So I'm going to get behind the wall, it drops down, now I need only a seven to save against you if you hit me, right? So so each unit um, is comprised of, like I said, a hero is one unit by itself with three special abilities, depending on the nation that you're a part of. Then you have a command unit that has uh, three to four uh, units with special abilities. That could be an engineer that can help fix a tank that's broken down uh, or damaged on the field. It could be a medic to help uh, the infantry units. 
Uh, it could be a commander to help boost your morale. Uh, or it could be um, a, a scientist, you know, that would give the unit some special ability. And then your infantry are uh, the first type is just regular infantry wearing a uniform, right? That's an armor mm -hmm. nine. And then you would have uh, infantry wearing armor, and then you would have light armor, heavy armor, and you would have powered armor. So those would be the th the, th the three different types of infantry you would have. Um, and then you would have support weapons, your machine guns, your mortars, your anti-tank guns, your howitzers, those type of things. And then you would have uh, armored cars, uh, appropriate for the time being, uh, time period. Uh, equipped as you see fit with Tesla cannons. Uh, if you're allies, mm -hmm. death rays, if you're, uh, you know, if you're German or Prussian empire. Uh, so each nation has its own unique ability and, and, and power. And then you would have uh, a tank, light tank or heavy tank. Uh, so, you know, you can see it's, it's flexible, it's customizable, and again, we're not telling you how to play the game. We're just giving you the toys and letting you, you know, have at it. All right, uh, that's that's uh, pretty cool. I'm I'm definitely a fan of uh, death rays and Tesla cannons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So each weapon has its own um, uh, uh, hit probability. So there's a so there's a damage chart. So on our uh, on our unit stack cards, so the game comes with stack cards. So it's a quick reference way for people to know, you know, how far their unit can shoot, how far they can move, uh, and what damage the weapons do. You know what their activation is, what their saving throw is, what their armor is. All that information is on your stack card, so you don't have to constantly go back to the the rule book to refer to it. Right. So on the stack card, you'll you'll have the weapon. You'll have the range that it shoots, and then the you'll have a number slash another number. The first number is the damage, the dice that you roll against infantry. And then the second number will be the whether or not it can affect a vehicle, an armored vehicle, right? Okay. So, with the, so with the Tesla cannon, it's three slash three. The first three is how many dice you roll against infantry, and then the second number is the dice you roll against armored vehicles right so the tesla cannon is equal against infantry and against armored vehicles and it has an arcing fire rule that if you roll a 10 on your dice then you can re-roll those 10s until it doesn't roll a 10 so you can continue to get hits <laughs> because the electricity arcs from one person to the other or one vehicle to another right um those those rules are always always interesting in games because, you know, it's it's always that point in time where you're like, oh, no, it's not going to happen. I haven't had this role all day long or whatever. And then all of a sudden your opponent, you know, manages to get it off and, you know, your entire unit just gets electrified. Yeah, we thought our rules were broken because when the first couple of games we play tested, like they never it was either they were rolling ones to fail or tens to hit, you know, and I was like, <laughs> what is going on? There's like there's numbers in between one and ten, guys. But you know they were rolling either it was a complete miss or they blew the thing up entirely. Yeah. So all the topes we had, were, yeah. So turret jammed, weapon destroyed, vehicle immobilized. You know, so all the other things we had written written into the stats were never used. You know, and then finally we got a game where you know those things were being used, but it was just it was just amazing that how often we would um we would play. The uh, uh, and you know it would be a complete miss or it would be utter destruction right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, so that, we thought it was something. That would yeah, make for we thought frustrating wrong. play testing. Oh, yeah, that's very frustrating play testing. You know, so you go back and you think about it and think about it, but we realize that there's no control over dice, right? That's just random chance at that point. You know, and then we noticed kind of trends where, you know, the dice would be hot in the beginning of the game and then, it, they, you know, then they'd fail them towards the end of the game. So the person that was rolling really good, destroying everything in the beginning of the game, you know, his dice would turn on him at the end. Oh, man, I always hate that. 
Yeah. I, so I always hate that even if I'm the person that's got the cold dice to begin with and then ends up with the hot dice towards the end. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, because it's just so frustrating. It makes the game so so lopsided feeling. Or it, you know, it changes from cold dice to hot dice at a point where it no longer makes a difference. Yeah, where well, you don't have <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah, I'm we've just had... two seconds from just saying I give up. Here you win, and then you start rolling, and you're like, "All right, I'll stick around," even though you know you really don't have a chance in hell of winning. Yeah, all your troops are deplenished. You know, <laughs> you don't you don't have enough uh, men to take the objective, or you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So so we watched that whole arc happen over the course of of a year, and uh, and it was it was really interesting. You know, it was, it was really interesting. That was one of the the other things that, you know, as looking at it as an observer and not a player, you know, I, you could take a a more objective uh, view of it. And I think that, that that gave us more insight into dice-based gaming, you know, come up with the best strategy and have the best tactics. But if the dice turn on you, you know, if you can't hit anything or kill anything, there's not much you can do about it. And that's yeah. the random chance of, of, of the game, you know? Yeah, it, it definitely is. And actually, I got, in a, I got in a big discussion. Actually, Tim and I both did with my nephew, who um, isn't a big uh, tabletop gamer. We were coming back from Adepticon, and he picked us up from the airport. And he said something about, you know, he, he wasn't a fan of tabletop games because, you know, basically the, the random nature of throwing dice. <laughs> and uh, Tim and I both kind of jumped at him. Of course, it was right after Adepticon, long plane ride and all that. So we were exhausted. But, you know, we're like, but it's it's not just the random nature of throwing the dice. It's the random nature of a battle. It's something, you know, people didn't hear the order or something broke, you know. Yeah, and the dice give you that stimulation of the fog of war, right? So, so that random that, that randomness in the dice is a mechanic that's used to simulate get the order. It didn't come through on time. The radio was dead. You know what I'm saying? Or you know, um, there was one famous quote from a, a British World War commander who was talking about how he was signaling his driver uh, to move forward. And instead, uh, because of the the din of the tank and the noise that was going on around him, the driver put it in reverse and his, his loader handed him a ham sandwich or a cheese sandwich or something, you know, and he goes, that's war. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like nobody you know, nobody can hear anything and you know you know here you are trying to tell order him to fire to move ahead and fire and he's kicking it in reverse and the loader is, is handing you a sandwich you know and yeah. it makes no sense at all right you know that's that's and that's the reality that's somebody who was really in you know uh, war and describing it so so i think that the dice uh as a mechanic uh really uh, bring that uh, to a point, and for somebody to just dismiss it as well, it's a random. It's not like you're just you know rolling craps. This is like your it's your strategy, your plans, and then even the best laid plans, right, can fall awry if the dice are not rolling right. Well, that that's your command structure, you know, built into it. And I know there's other um, games that that simulate that um, on a six sided system. I was thinking Chain of Command was one of those that I I've, I've played. Um, by uh, two flat lardies, and um, I, I love their love their rule systems. Um, I ain't dead yet. Mom was like my, my first uh, miniatures game, uh, World War Two miniatures game that I played, and I really enjoyed that one also. So there's a lot of games out there, you know, that try to uh, emulate that effect, and and the dice really give you that that fog of war, uh, like just the random nature. Of, of of what's happening and and the probability that eventually at some point something's going to go wrong. Definitely. Unfortunately, it it's always, you know, it's it's never at the, you know, at a convenient time when it goes wrong. It really does wait to make sure that you're like the most screwed when it decides to stop working for you. 
Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, Susan, Susan plays uh, Germans quite often and uh, had that experience. Far too many times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, no. Yeah, I, uh... so it's still... Yeah, she likes to bring the, the, the you know the biggest cats on the field and then intimidate other players. And uh, <laughs> one time, she uh, she showed up with a a king tiger, and the guys changed the rules that oh you can't have anything over armor nine <laughs> to play because <laughs> they they had nothing that could touch it. But not realize mm. that you know it's a paper, you know it's a paperweight, it's a distraction. So she distracted them with the king tiger, and she ran her troops around to take the objective because the game was to take the objective. Oh yeah, spent all their, you know. So while they spent all their trying, you know, time, you know, trying to kill this thing, and it was just soaking up bullets, you know, she was able to to move on the objective. So that was a really good strategy, you know, that you know that yeah, people definitely. can use. Scare people away with the giant tank and <laughs> yeah. Don't look at this shiny tank over here. Pay no attention to my grenadiers moving over to the objective on the other side of the table. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't look yeah. over here. Don't don't look over there. Don't don't, don't look over there. Nothing. 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 <laughs> you you yeah, don't nothing at all. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and the other really interesting thing about a rule sets, you know, people learn it in what? So you say about fifteen minutes? Or less. Yeah. They pick it up really quick, and I think the reference cards help. Once they understand it's move, uh, you know, you get two actions per turn. So you can move and attack, or you can attack and move. It doesn't matter which order, you know, or you can aim, you know. So on the chart, it gives you all the different things you can do and then how many actions it costs you to do it. Some things cost two actions, so you can only do that one thing during your unit's turn. And other things only cost one action, so you can do that and do something else. So let's say you wanted to move across a field, and your maximum movement is 12 inches. Or your movement is 6 inches, so your maximum movement would be 12, because a movement only costs one action. So you can move twice, which would put you 12 inches across the field. Right. Okay. Right. You know, uh, so, so inside of that, there's a lot of different things, like, you know, uh, sneaking you know, uh, going down, hiding behind stuff. You know, those are all actions that can be taken. Uh, you can aim for an action. Let's say I just want to aim and shoot. You know, aiming is one action. Shooting is one action. Right. You know, so uh, an aim gives me a plus one uh, to hit bonus. So now instead of needing a five to hit, if I'm a veteran unit, I would only need a four better to hit if I took my time and aimed at you. All right. But when you have our you know, but if you have artillery fire coming in, you might have to move and shoot because <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get ranged in by artillery, so that might not be an option for you. So, um hopefully the game mechanics are simple enough for people t- to learn um but but have enough meat on the bones where people can customize it. And again, like I said, enjoy the hobby the way they want to enjoy it. We don't want to try to pigeonhole people into a certain style of play. We want people to be, you know, the rules will be flexible enough for people to enjoy them in the way that they like to play, whether you like to play aggressively or defensively, you know, you can build your army based, based on that. So, uh, the rules allow for, um, for, let's say if you take damage, you get, uh, suppression markers, Mm-hmm. Rob, right. historique, Rob Prince makes our suppression markers for us. And so uh, each um, at a veteran level can take three suppressions and then you have to take a wound. So the next turn, if you still have those suppression markers on you at the beginning of the next turn, when that unit activates, it's a random draw system, you know, token out of a bag representing right. each unit. So when it's your turn to play, uh, depending on how many suppression markers and what your veterancy is, um, that's the number you have to beat. So let's say I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a veteran uh, unit. Uh, my activation is three plus, but then I have three suppression on me. Right, I would have to roll a six or better for to obey a command, or else I stay down. Okay. Like other games. Yeah, so Makes sense. so I can roll. Yeah, so I roll the ten sided, and then 
if I do better than a six, I can run and shoot or do whatever it is I want to do. The suppression marker comes off. It doesn't wind down three, two, one. The whole thing comes off. Okay. So your opponent has has to then um, put more firepower on you to suppress you again because you've become motivated, you know, to fight, right? So one of the uh, strategies that people use is that they they wait till the end of the of that turn to shoot at infantry units. You know, they wait till the infantry to activate, then they shoot at it to put suppression on it. So they'll have to roll to activate the next turn. So that's one of the strategies that that have come out of this game that I've seen people who've played it a couple of times that have used, you know, instead of shooting at the infantry from the beginning and then pressure on them. And then when it's their turn to activate, they roll, remove the suppression. Now they're able to fire back at you. Right. Right. So that's, that's one of the, yes. Yeah. So the, so that's one of the, the um, one of the int- intricacies of the game we discovered while playing it. Um, the other one is what? Don't bring your tank on turn one. <laughs> that sounds it gets, like there's a good story behind it. Yeah. You want to tell that one? Well, they tend to get blown up right away because it's good eye candy and everybody wants to, um, everybody wants to shoot at the tank. I wonder why that is. Maybe because so, it's a giant death machine. Yes, the death ray or those great Tesla cannons. Machine guns poking out of all sides. Yeah, yeah. So that happens. So there's a yeah. So there's some intricacies of the game that, like I said, we discovered as uh, uh, as we were playing it. So um, that became obvious as we've watched different people play the scenarios over and over again. You know, we've seen these different techniques that people have used, you know, that we've taken note of. Um, and so that's how um, the suppression mechanism uh, works in the game and activating a unit once it's become suppressed, how that works. Like I said, each unit has its own armor based upon, you know, um, whether you're infantry, there's those four levels of, uh, of infantry armor that just being, you know, regular uniform, uh, light body armor, heavy body armor, and powered armor. Um and then in vehicles, it's the same way. It's light armor, medium armor, and heavy armor. So, you know, a light armor would be like an armored car. Uh, uh, medium armor would be like uh, a light tank. And then heavy armor would be a, a heavy tank. So okay. so all that's taken into consideration. Um, armor only counts when you're, when you're saving against being hit. Uh and uh, v- our vehicles come with crews, so a vehicle can be hit, and you can dismount a crew, on a crew to take an objective, because vehicles can't take objectives just by themselves. So people can't roll a tank over to an objective and sit on it all game. You know, you have to disembark your 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 crew to get it. Uh, that's another thing I think uh, we wanted to bring to the game that other people had problems with other games with. Was uh you know, if a unit got within six inches of a of a vehicle, then destroyed. I didn't, I didn't. That didn't make any sense to me. You know, so we made sure we incorporated it uh, in our game that has a certain number of crew that can take damage or be killed. So you can actually have a sniper, the crew of a vehicle, if it's open topped, kill that crew, and then have your infantry come in and take the vehicle. Uh, that's that's kind of neat. Yeah, that's uh, definitely different. Yeah, so so that's a unique feature, uh, we think, in the game um, that we thought to make it interesting. Uh, um, what else? If people want to read the rules, they can go to the Facebook page. Yeah, we have a Facebook page called uh, the General Assembly Universal Rules System, and people who want to try out the rules, uh, we're at Beta 1.0, which should be up tomorrow. Um, uh, 20th. For people to try out and download. Yeah. And we also have unit cards. The unit cards are up there. If people want to try the game out before they, you know, support us, they they can do so, you know. All right. It, it's not the final artwork, but it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, we're in beta, you know. 
Yeah, um, makes sense. Um, so we want to make sure that you know people understand you know what it is we're doing and that we're trying to put out a quality product uh, for the gaming community because we're enthusiasts. You know, the same way they are. You know, they'll enjoy the models. They'll enjoy the quality of the models uh, of and the and of our figures and of our our vehicles. Um, and and they'll have fun playing it because that's what we'll be playing this year at every convention <laughs> that we go to. <laughs> so people get a chance to come in and play, you know. And and we give uh, if the thing funds, you know, we have great price support, you know, for stores, you know, if they want to uh, carry it, and for uh, people who enjoy it and are enthusiasts, you know, we have a lot of people around here that went gung ho once they played it. We have a couple of. Uh, you know, people are it's like, oh, I just wrote this this unit. You got to put it in your game. I'm like, if you wrote it, it's already in the game. <laughs> 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 you, you play it. It's, it's The game is made for you. <laughs> right. You know. So, uh, yeah. But it's, it's a place for people to share ideas about the rules. And, you know, people can upload their own version of the unit cards and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, we wanted to make it as um, as, as user-friendly as we possibly could. And we want to give as much support to the user community um, uh, uh, as, as we can, you know, th- that we're able to, you know, for being a small company. But hopefully, you know, we'll, you know, we'll be around for a while and we'll grow. This is our, this is our third year uh, in business. So... You know, uh, it's looking pretty good uh, awesome. so far. Yeah, and like I said, we have uh, the the three different product lines, and we'll have and we're making new miniatures all the time. You know, we're right now we're casting up uh, some Russian uh, Imperial Guard uh, miniatures, and we're doing uh, some more Weird War vehicles, and then hopefully next year we'll be able to launch uh, the Weird War War Two. Uh, stuff that we want to launch uh for this universe and um just came in yeah so our dreadnought art that you've seen came in the battle suits which i think will be really popular um it seems to be popular in our games when people are playing so hopefully people uh will enjoy the style the art style it's, it's very stylized you know for the for the period yes it's but, it's very large and clunky looking yeah, as it as it would be, yeah, being being the diesel era where everything is powered by oil and and gas, right? Okay, and hopefully they'll have fun painting it and 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 collecting them. It um it definitely looks like some of it would definitely be fun to paint. I uh, I keep looking at the um the well, this says Russian Royal Guard. Yeah, the Russian Royal Guard, yep. Yeah, I kept saying Prussian in my head until I actually read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and there there'll be Prussian units too. We're getting those as soon as those come back from the from the uh from our artist. You know, we got him working on overtime. I'm sure he doesn't mind. Yeah. No, no, money <laughs> money never stops. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but so yeah, the more you, know, you get I, done, uh, the more. Nope. Go ahead. Yeah, I said that. You know, the more you get done, you know, that's just more bonus for you. You know, so enjoy the work that's that's coming out, um, the artwork and the style, and hopefully, uh, our you know the fans of the game will too. And uh, and as the game gets more popular, you know, we're well, you know, as people create units, we'll be more than happy to create models. You know, for those units, because like I said, we've created hero units for uh, uh, for the Allies, which are the Harlem Hell Fighters. But the Prussians have their own Totenkopf units. The Germans have their their own Bismarck units. Um, the Ottomans have their own units. The uh, Russians, like you see with the Royal Guard, are just one set of units. And then we have, um, you know, a galvanic rifle team, which will be coming out the regular infantry. So, you know, not only will you have the regular historical infantry, but then you'll have these supplemental units, you know, and then what really surprised me about World War One is how much body armor was used in, in real life. Actually had like these 
the, uh, the Germans that had lobster armor, they called it, because it looked like, you know, you were a lobster tail when you were wearing it because it was segmented armor. Right. Um, and, you know, and the Russians had um, these uh, look like uh, pieces with um, chest plates with uh, crotch guards attached to them. Um, and it was just interesting. Even the French had, you know, they used uh, over their uniforms uh, to protect them. It, well, so, you know, World War One was was definitely one of those points in history where you know technology and warfare really collided, and you know the the realization that you know all these old things that we used to do no longer will work, no longer can work. Because, right, you know. That that bit of armor, you know, no longer will actually deflect a bullet. That bullet will pierce it, you know. Whereas, even, You're right? Yeah, the bullet got more powerful. E- yeah, and even just a few years before that, because you know that was the thing was that um, there was several wars just before that. You know, their their armor still worked for them. Yeah, yeah. You had yeah the the. The you had ballistics and, and metallurgy were coming to a head, right? Because the French were 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 producing more and more powerful uh, b- cartridges to propel their bullets, which were becoming larger, and therefore uh, a, a man could not carry a thick enough piece of armor to make it you know, worthwhile on a battlefield, you know, uh, your average yeah, person yeah. couldn't carry a, a sheet of iron, you know, thick enough, uh, that was light enough for you to be able to move, uh, to stop, the, uh, of, of, of a bullet. And in fact, the Russians came up with the first, um, anti-tank rifle or was it the germans i think it was the russians they had the first anti-tank rifle because they realized that the that even though the tank was really scary it had thin armor and they could shoot through it so so that's when the 50 caliber bullet came into play um yep and then you know the cavalry charge all of a sudden became null and void because there was widespread use of the machine gun which could cut you know man and horse down before they right. got halfway across the field, and yeah, no, um, you you said it earlier. You know, World War One's kind of one of those exciting turning points for for people in in the fact that uh, you know technology, the just all of the technologies that you know came out, tanks, and- yeah, aviation, the start of aviation, ballistics, metallurgy, um, the use of of armored fighting vehicles. You know, mechanized warfare that was all rooted out of World War One. You know, uh, up to modern day. You know, there's still effects that ripple through through uh, through the military and how we fight based on. I mean, nobody does trench warfare anymore, right? Yeah, you know, well, yeah, uh, because of World War One, marching across a field in in in, in column, <laughs> rank and file anymore because of the machine gun. Yeah. You know? Which was, you know, what what drove them into the trenches to begin with, and then they realized that was just a bad idea, right? <laughs> but they didn't have a better right. solution, so kind of, yeah, kinda sat there for a few years and just suffered horrendous amounts of casualties. Yeah, yeah, I think it was fifty thousand guys the British lost in one charge because they just, you know, the they had s- smoke on the field and the soldiers just marched across the field into machine gun fire. Yep, and just kept going, and just kept going. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, so you have, you know, today's battles fought with today's weapon and 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 yesterday's strategies. You know, <laughs> ask ask the French about the Maginot Line. <laughs> <laughs> how did, how did that work for them? Yeah, actually, that that came up in a discussion the other day. Somebody. Somebody said something, you know, something along, you know, basically, you know, oh, well, we can go back to doing this. I'm like, yeah, well, how about you go have a conversation with the French about, you know, doing something that used to work, but, you know, can't possibly work now. 
And, yeah, and they just the Germans, looked at me funny. Yeah, because the Germans just went around it. You know, if you have a static <laughs> wall that doesn't move, you just go around it. Yeah, I was like, uh, Machino line, just drive around it. Yeah, just go right around. There's things called roads now, and they have panzer units that are mechanized <laughs> with wheels. Yeah. They're not they're not marching rank and file through a field to go up to your wall <laughs> and and knock on the door and say, Hey, let us in. No. Hey, hey little man hey little Frenchman, hey little Frenchman, let me in. And, and that's by the hair of my chinny chin chin. <laughs> and I will your imaginal line down. No, we're just gonna roll across it in a plans in a in a panzer blitz. How about that? <laughs> We're just going to go around this side of it. Is that okay? Okay, that's good. Okay, that's good. Oh, I, she'd be surrounded. I am late Ooh. tired. I am late tired. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, for us, so, like I said, we thought it was a really good jumping off point. Um, adding in that the Martian invasion gives you the weird war feel to it. You can still play historically, uh, like we said. Um, and in the box game, you get uh, 20 infantry. Uh, two vehicles, your rules, your dice, you know, everything that you need to play. Uh, like I said, the dice system is adversarial, so you roll to attack, taking your minuses for uh, any blocking terrain or line of sight or bonuses, and then you, uh, the other player rolls to defend. So another thing about it is that both players are engaged all the time, being for you to complete your turn. So right. either you're moving and you're seeing where the other person moves, or you know, or you're attacking, you're you're defending, thinking up ways to attack the player. So, emotion. Both players constantly stay engaged. You know, so there's no well. Um, oh, we're playing this large game, so I'm going to get a pop and order dinner while you take your turn, and I'll be back. Where that's happened in in other yeah uh, games where you know. You know, it's a it's twenty minutes, and the guy's still taking his turn. <laughs> you know, well, what are you doing in the meantime? You know, may have been the person that's gone to get a pop, ordered dinner, come ate dinner, come back, and been like, um, yeah. So you haven't moved yet? Yeah, I'm still in psycher phase. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, are we ready for shooting phase. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of stuff. So we wanted the game to be like I said, um. We wanted it to be rich, you know, have a rich environment. So we gave it that, you know, that weird war background to it. But we wanted it to be easy to play. So that's why we use the D10 system. And we wanted it to be quick and fun. And so far, I think that we've, we're, you know, the feedback that we've been getting that we hit on all cylinders. But hopefully the listeners of the podcast will go on the General Assembly Universal Rules data system, you know, try it out for themselves, you know. And uh, and give us feedback because I'm sure you know there's things that we've missed that we you know haven't thought of the sample size that we have. We were using some guys that had beta tested for uh, for Malifaux, okay, and for uh, and for AE World War II. So they were professional rules breakers, and <laughs> uh, and uh, just to break the rules. So they do it in 40k all the time. You know they figure out ways that you know oh, yeah. how to max oh, yeah. a lift out. So, so we had them run it, run us through, and uh, like, well, this is broken. This is broken. Change this. And I was like, okay. And then the next time we played, he goes, he goes, what are you going to do about cavalry? And I'm like, yeah, they had a cavalry in World War One. So we wrote in the rules for cavalry, and so he brought out a cavalry list with a hero unit that had the um, times they come back rule. Mm-hmm. That so if you kill him, he can come back again twice for him to be dead and so he so he took what he thought was the most broken things in our rule system and he pointed out his army i think it was 230 points each he had 220 i had 20 but he took cavalry so he had a lot of really expensive powerful units so cavalry gets like an extra move uh where you can roll a 10-sided die and that's how many inch, extra inches they get to move right and so he came so he came across the field, charged at me with his hero unit on horseback with a cavalry unit. Uh, he got behind my lines, but 
the thing is, when he got, uh, the whole time he was charging at me, I was firing at him with just regular, I had no special units. I just had regular infantry and, and my one hero unit. And, uh, and we engaged. I shot down his units. He got suppressed. He couldn't come across for one turn. He rolled the second turn uh, got unsuppressed, came across, engaged me. But meanwhile, I was whittling, whittling his guys down the whole time he was charging at me. So when he got over, it was a hero unit and a few cavalry left. And so I killed him. He came back. I mean, we were down to like, I think I had like three models and he had like two, you know. <laughs> and it was just, you know, tooth and nail. And um, and there's a close combat rule that you get to roll two dice uh, if you have um, a swordsman ability. And... uh we played it all out all the way through to the last turn. And he goes, uh, he goes, this is how I broke AE World War II. He said, they introduced cavalry, and I just rolled the cavalry around, just wiping out all of the other guys' units. And we told them it was broken, and they didn't change it, and people stopped playing. And so we were like, wow. And I go, so what do you think? He goes, he goes, it works. He goes, it works. He says, it's not broken. So our core rule survived that that test, that he took the most, what he thought was the most overpowered things, like made the most cheesy list possible. And, and, the, and it, was, it was balanced. It, it was a balanced game. And that, so, that, is, that is definitely a good testament because I have games that I definitely love, and yet I definitely know that there are... Uh, Lots of balancing issues. Yeah, exploits in the game? Uh, it's. I mean, I don't know if you can call it exploits when it's, you know, basically purposely written. <laughs> it's written that way, yeah. yeah. It's, it's written that way. It's supposed to have been play-tested, validated. I mean, you know, it's, it's all those things. So, you know, it, it's one of those ones it's, you know, well... You know, can I can I really call it an exploit, or you know, is it just that uh, you guys failed <laughs> at your job? <laughs> you failed. You just had the one job, Mikey. The one job. <laughs> yeah, the one job, and that was to make sure that my game was going to be balanced. And now I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I know for certain it isn't. Right. Yeah. So for us, that was really important to make sure that the game, you know, was fun and that it was balanced that everybody had an equal chance to win, you know, that you couldn't just bring one Death Star and, and, and white guy, you know, that on any given Sunday, uh, either army had, had a chance to win. So that was important to us. Um, yeah. And that's why we got, you know, some of the the top beta testers in our area to play, you know, if they, you know, they beta tested for weird and, and, uh, and Mantic, you know, so, so for us, it was, um, it was, it was important, uh, to make sure that people had fun. That was at the top of our list, you know? Um, and so with, with having, you know, the point system and having, um, uh, what you could take. So it's three powers per hero unit. So you can't have an, uh, a a guy that's too overpowered, and to um to make sure that when people were playing, um that they could customize their armies, but not make it so that it's so uh so powerful that nobody wants to play you. And that's what happened when we we were playing X Wing and they came out with Dangar and people start running three uh, Jumpmaster five hundreds and it just broke the game. Because they were just, <laughs> there was no strategy involved. They would just go up and down the table in a line, and just shoot everything. I mean, there's nothing you can really do about it. Uh, I was, I had, I had moved kind of into the collection phase of X-wing by that point in time when, uh, you know, when Dengar, Dengar was came out. out. Um, yeah, not yeah. not because of anything so every- with the mechanics, but yeah, watching watching all the pictures of people who were just flying the. Uh, flying those massive lists, you know, it made me sad. Yeah, because it, there's no strategy involved in the game. I mean, we were playing casual, and we just liked this, 
you know, just seeing what, what you could come up with and because it looked cool, you know, not because we wanted to max out or dominate every time we played, you know, cause you could, you could do that, you know? And then I, and then well, one of our friends said, well, it's not broken. It's broken. He said, that's a feature. <laughs> he said, because then, you know, that it's broken this, uh, uh, launch. And then when they come out with the next series, the next wave, they fix that last thing that's broken, but then they break something else. And then the next wave, they fix that thing, and then they break something else. So you got, you're you constantly on this, this you know, hamster wheel of trying to catch up. Uh, unfortunately, that's that's not too far off from the truth with uh, most of the experience in X-Wing, at least. Yeah, yeah. And some games that, that you know, <laughs> it's not broken, it's a feature. Yeah, you know, but for us, you know, it's not like that because we we want to make sure that people have a good time. I mean, you know, we want to make sure the game is balanced. We want to make sure that people have fun building and 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 even if they just want to collect the armies, you know, maybe they, you know, uh, you know, uh, that that's fine too. You know, we don't have a problem with that. But we're not, we're never going to intentionally uh, have a broken feature in the game where it's so overpowered and. And a fan has pointed it out to us and not addressed that that issue. I know some people have some fetishes about machine guns and what their cycle rate should be and what the turn uh, radius of a, of a turret on a tank should be. But that's mm-hmm. not us. Again, beer, beer and pretzels. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what the cycle rate of, of an MG42 is or a maximum machine gun, but I'm sure it's high. So we just put, you know, they shoot this many dice. <laughs> this is what they can damage, you know. And every tank gets a ninety degree uh, turn arc. <laughs> nice. And, and a turret is three hundred sixty degrees. I mean, we don't go into the deflection angle of your sloped armor. I mean, that's not. This is not that game. I, I have p- played uh, uh, Panzer Leader, and uh, you know. <laughs> if I had eight hours to spend in the game, then that's the game I would play. But this is not that game. Awesome. You know. All right. Yeah. Um, so we are we are coming up close to time, if not exceeded the time. That's pretty typical. Um, oh, wow, quick. It it does it it does go quick. So go ahead and take uh, the next minute or two and share all the wonderful places where. Our listeners can find more about you, the game, and all sure. that jazz. Sure. Um, any social media you go to, you could type this Gaddis, Gaddis Gaming and we'll be there. On Facebook, we're Gaddis Gaming. Uh, we are uh, G-A-D-D-I-S Gaming, G-A-M-I-N-G. Uh, we are on Google Plus under Gaddis Gaming. We have a Shattered Crown community uh, where people can share pictures and and talk and chat on Facebook. Uh, we have the Shattered Crown site, which is just for the Shattered Crown game. And then we have the General Assembly Universal Rules Data System, which is just for talking about the rules uh, and downloading the data cards and, and the beta uh, copy of the rules. Uh, we also have um, uh, the Gaddis Gaming Store site, which is just stuff about, um, you know, things that are going on in general uh, here in the world of Gaddis Gaming. Um, and uh, so that's... And, and of course, uh, we appreciate any support. If you find this interesting, please just pledge on the Kickstarter. And remember, it, you don't have to pay until the Kickstarter funds. Uh, so so there's that. Um, and we hope that people will find a... Um, find a pledge level that they feel comfortable with. And we hope that they'll uh, in, enjoy the game and, and, and enjoy uh, the hobby uh, in their own way and, and, and share our little corner of the, uh, of the Weird War universe. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at Tim at SkirmishSupremacy.com or Nick at SkirmishSupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.